So in the next one and a half hours, I'm gonna introduce another package, which is also for machine learning, or more specifically, it's about deep learning. So it's called MXNet. I'll briefly go over the configuration. So because it's not, um, it's a whole bunch of tools that makes deep learning running so well today. So the basic building blocks you're gonna have is OpenCVN and OpenBlast on Linux and Mac. Yeah, question? Okay, no. So on Linux and Mac, probably you're gonna install them. And on Windows, the binary build comes with it. If you want to further train with a NVIDIA GPU, in case you have it, you don't want to waste it, you're gonna configure CUDA and QDNN from NVIDIA. So I'm not gonna talk about this because it's gonna occupy our entire full time frame. <laughs> yes, it's a little bit uh, difficult if you are configuring them the first time, but I believe that the docs are sufficient enough. Okay, so configuration for CPU only version, and this is the version that we're gonna use today. We're, gonna, we're not gonna do too heavy computations here. So we've got an official guide, which to access, to remember how to access easier, you just go to mxnet.io. It's gonna span the URL automatically. Click install and toggle with the bottoms. Here are a bunch of different uh, settings that your OS, your interface, CPU or GPU and things like that. Um, yeah. So Linux, you can follow the installation instruction. And for OS X and Windows, we have our own hosted CRAN mirror just for MXNet. So if you follow these instructions, then you can have them installed. And by the way, the pre-built uh, version for GPU is still ongoing because, as I mentioned previously, the CUDA and CUDN, they really affect the build package. So we're so uh, we are trying to set up different virtual machines with CUDA 80 or CUDA 90 or CUDA 91 or CUDA 92 and offer different binaries so people have more choices. So, so far it's, it's still a work in progress. We want to open, uh, automate that process. Yeah. So note that several people uh, told me that maybe OSX, the OpenCV and OpenBlast are not installed by default, or maybe they're in the older version. So if you meet difficulty installing, probably you can try to brew install OpenCV and OpenBlast. Sometimes it's gonna warn you specifically when you're loading your MXNet, it says uh, library not loaded or something. If you read the exact name of the library, usually it's gonna hint you if it's lib open blast or lib open cv something is not found, then it's an indicator that you need to install uh, some of these libraries. Okay, so if you've got a super powerful GPU at home and you don't want to waste it to do some computation or if in your company you've got servers or if you ran cloud machines with powerful GPUs, you don't want to waste them, so just remember when you're uh, viewing the page, you toggle GPU here. So it's gonna give you some information on it. And for Windows, uh, here is, uh, there, there are two, uh, Windows does not work too well with OpenCV, so please, uh, we have some pre-built libraries for Windows because in window, on Windows, in my own experience, it's pretty painful to set up the whole tool chain. So we offer the pre-built libraries for you to link to it. And here is a third party written, well-written documentation guiding you how to build your own GPU version. And our officially built GPU version will be supported shortly, like maybe in the end of this month or somewhere. And yeah. So we can start. I would like to make this session more hands-on. So maybe you can start, if you have it installed, try uh, library MXNet. 
And so here, uh, we, we, can, we can run it in my Azure server. Yeah. Okay, so first line is we are loading a package into our environment. And the second one is we, we are directly using a function mxnet. We're going to talk about it later uh, in detail. And this is a function that defines a mxnet specific data structure that allows us to do computation on CPU or GPU, which is a boost in our performance. And also, we can do that with vectorized uh, operation. OK, uh, in case some of you have GPU, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is to show here, it's a server with one GPU, sorry, with one GPU so that I can demonstrate how GPU computation looks like. So CTX is, means context, which means under which context we're going to allocate our memory for, these, uh, for this object. Oops. Mm. Yeah, and by, by default, it's MSNet CPU, and so everyone should have this running smoothly. Got too many windows. Wait a second. I'm gonna... Okay. Okay. So let's talk about in the array, which is the data structure that we're gonna to play with. So in the array is a data structure that we cr have created to offer com uh, efficient computation on both CPU and GPU. So a bit more into why we need GPU is that, so CPU is designed for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not expert on it, but CPU is designed for a general task, not only purely for flow point computations, but GPU is more designed for that because it's for graphs, uh, computation, and in com computer vision and computer graphs, there are a lot of flow point computations, so it's, specifically designed for that. So when you're having a task like matrix multiplication and similar things, GPU is going to offer you a faster speed. Um, so with array, if it's on CPU or GPU really depends on the previous slide, the, where, the, where we assign its context. If you assign its context to MX GPU, then it's going to be on GPU. And in case you've got multiple GPUs, you can have an index on it. For example, I only have one GPU here on my server, so it by default is actually GPU 0. If I try to access GPU 1, it's going to crash because there's, it can't find the second GPU. Yeah, and if you're installing CPU, it's going to uh, complain that you have to build your library with CUDA enabled, which means you don't ask, have access. You can't communicate with the GPU yet, yet, which makes the difference of the CPU version and GPU version. Yeah. So with NVRA, it offers a bunch of tools and functions that we can, we can use. So here, we can transform a R object, say an R vector here, one to five, into MX in the array. And we can print it as how we print an R vector, but it has a different type of class. It's actually not a R vector or numeric type anymore. So we can perform vectorized uh, operator on it. We can have A plus one over A, so we have a vector as well. And B here is also another in the array. It's not an R vector. We do some math. We offer a bunch of mathematical operator. So we can take a log. Or sometimes we can do sampling. If you want to do a lot of a uh, sample of one million numbers, probably want to do that directly with in the array without doing that in R and then uh, merge them into your uh, and the array on CPU or GPU. So to get a sense of what kind of information, uh, what kind of operator we have, uh, we, because we 
constantly add operators and we update it and we generate these R symbols automatically. So we, in R Studio, I find it's pretty convenient to get information on what we have here. So with the autocomplete, it's gonna load every, every available uh, symbol operator in your environment and you can just find we have like sign or arc max or other things. And so if you're, uh, yeah, so uh, for math, of course, we have log and sum or other stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. We can also convert them back to our vector matrix or array. So the name in the array means that it supports data in the shape of multi-dimensional array. It could be, if it was one dimension, then it's, uh, it's a vector. If it's two dimension, if two dimension is a matrix, and with three or more, we just call it a multi-dimension array, or just array. It's what we have the same data structure in R as well. Yeah, so we have to find, so MX in the ones, sorry, it is a function uh, creating an array filled with ones. Of course, we have MX in the dot zeros, which is filling the array by zeros. And here, the first parameter here, we define the dimension of the array. If you Right, C, Q, three, four, then probably you're gonna get uh, a multi, a, oh sorry. So yeah, because A is, has three dimensions, you can't, uh, you can convert it back as a matrix. So instead we can array, yeah. Yeah, so they're all one. It's a two times three times four multi-dimensional array. And this, uh, and this is an R object right now, but they should contain the same information. Okay, uh, well, I, we, we have already demonstrated this part, which is a change in the context. Hey, why not a data type? It's purely just for one single reason. We want the computation to be done on GPU. Although today we're not gonna touch it, but just remember this is very important. This is the next demo we're gonna show. We're gonna show the different uh, difference in the efficiency of computation. So for example, we can have a matrix of a moderate size, which is 4,000 by 4,000. When you do a computation in R, well, according to my history, it cost like uh, 12 seconds to, uh, to do that. Yeah, still I'm going. I'll leave it around for, for a few more seconds. And then with ND array, we also can have them run on, uh, on CPU, but the underlying library are implemented differently because the previous one, we're using the library directly from R, and the other one, we have used it from MXNet. Yeah, so it's been finished. It's 12 seconds. And uh, here, according to my history, I've got a, it's like a spoiler. I got a around three seconds, uh, three, uh, sorry, six seconds. Yeah, so they're all run on CPU. As you can see, I only set contacts with MS CPU. So what is it gonna be if we have it on GPU. Yeah, it's there. Just point 0.1 second. Yeah, so I hope this example is, it's simple, but I hope it's impressive enough. Yeah, because when we're training models, we constantly play with a bunch of model, a bunch of matrices. We do multiplication, where we manipulate with it. And so it's gonna drastically increase the efficiency. Yeah, so there's one more feature that I would like to let you know that we're actually doing a asynchronous computation. What does it mean is that we can uh, check from this example. So, so we use the previous matrix. We assign it to uh, A, which is an ND array here. And then we perform mx.nd.dot, which is a dot product we have used previously to do matrix multiplication. So see some time here, we can see it just costs zero. It shouldn't be because it's on CPU. 
right? We expect it's around six seconds. But then, if just following that, we're doing as matrix, this step took six seconds. That sounds weird. But then, and the next time, we redo that conversion from NBRA to the matrix in R, they only cost 0 0.08 seconds, which sounds more uh, valid. So what's the, so what's going on? Because that is uh, when we are having B slime being called, we start another thread doing the computation. And when we are trying to convert it back to in R, we are still waiting for a result there on the other thread to be completed in other process. So keep in mind that although this line seems to be finished instantly, we can see that. Yes, it's finished instantly, but at that time, we're not able to get it unless it's finished. So this is asynchronous compu computation that we are actually having a bunch of other workers underneath, like hiding somewhere that you don't see it when you're interacting with R, but they, they won't block your operation unless you're trying to get access to that, to the information. So for example, that uh, naturally uh, enables you to do some uh, operations in parallel. Um, I don't have a concrete example here, but if you have uh, multiple issues to do, you don't have to wait for that matrix computation to be finished after, uh, so before you can uh, perform your next task. If your task is not related to that matrix, so you can have them like, run somehow uh, in some kind of parallelization. And then when you're accessing it, if it's finished, you just naturally got the, got the result without any bottleneck. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, that's the reason why we're, I think in my example, it doesn't use OpenCV. No, it doesn't use OpenBlast. Usually, it does, and I parallelize on your CPU, yeah. But with OpenBlast, you also enable your R to use OpenBlast as well. If there's a way to do that. Um, it's, 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 not, it's not what we're going to cover, but we can discuss about that offline. Okay, so this is in the array. Okay, next, um, that's the building, this is a building block, very basic block that we're going to use as part of our neural network computation. So this is basically uh, what a neural network looks like. So on the left most part, the leftmost column, the blue circles, they are the input. So here, the demo is pretty simple. It's a three-dimensional data with a bias on it. And these two, uh, these two layers are fully connected, which means every pair of nodes from the previous layer and this layer, they have a connection. So the connection means that there's a weight assigned to the connection so that we, we have a value. And these node input data, they have a value and we do a multiplication and we assign to here, and we'll, we'll talk about there will be an activation and some stuff later. So prior than that, I would like to play around with this demo, although it's from TensorFlow, but I always borrow good stuff from the others. So I'm not sure if you know about this page. I see it's one of the best demo there to let people know how neural network predicts and to, to visualize how the weights are changed and how, our, how the, our, the network structure is gonna affect the final result. So for example here, we can play with the network structure and play with net, network input. So the input is gonna, the data we're going to classify is a two-dimensional data, the points. So we have an outer circle and an inner core. So there are two classes. And what we're using is our input here for simplicity, we just use x1 and x2, which are just their, uh, uh, their position on this two-dimensional surface. And we have a hidden layer here. We have four neurons 
And then for output, because we're doing a two-class classification, we have two neurons. One neuron output the probability for first class and second probability uh, for second class, and then we add a softmax to just to normalize our prediction. So if this, if the first neuron output a very large value, but our second neuron can output an even larger value so that by normalization we may still predict that it's, uh, the data point belongs to the second neuron. So just remember that usually we have a submax here. Okay, so uh, we can set up a lot of different things. We just keep the learning rate fixed. Activation, we can use the value or a ton. We just use the uh, default value. We use everything default and we have classification. Just set it. We can run. Yeah. So here on the top right, it's a loss function, which is pretty similar to what we have introduced in the previous session. An attribute is that is the goal that uh, how we want to teach our model to fit, and where's the direction to go. So we can see that the loss function is pretty, pretty low. It's 0 0.001, and test is 0 0.02. They're pretty close, and they're doing a perfect job. Okay, so here, um, so here is the input. So the color here, the left, means it by it's zero. Wait, how can I fix it? Well, so we have x-axis. There's a wide band in the middle. It's the y-axis and split it into left and right. And x2 is uh, there's another wide band horizontally split it up and down. And then we have our neurons. Oh wait, did I just reset the neural network? Anyway, we'll turn it again. So um, I think it's not learning this time. We restart. Wait. Oh, I see. Yeah, we can't do that with one-dimensional input. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so we trained it. So you can see that there are four hidden neurons. I can explain it later, but. Here, this neuron captures the left lower part so that it classified that part as the yellow class and the other part is blue, doesn't matter. And it also did the other things and they are trying to learn about the data in some, other, in some other way. And then here we have two neurons. It classifies the data with a curve but this neuron does a better job here. So it correctly um, figure out a pattern here. It should be an inner core and an outer circle. So how does it learn that they have a nonlinear pattern? It's because we have an activation function. So we mentioned that with the weight here, we can see the weight. If you hover your mouse onto the link, you can see the weight. The thicker and the darker the color is, the higher the weight value will be. And after, if we only do a weight time the input value, then it's still gonna be linear. We will, by no luck, to get, uh, to learn about a circle. But with activation, introduce a non-linearity so that every different layer of neurons who are learning different layer of linearity, uh, non-linearity relationships, then finally we form a circle into it. Okay, so, um, and then we can try a pretty, pretty hard example. So, the sprawl, I doubt with this weak uh, neural network we can learn that because maybe the information we have here is not enough. Yeah, it slowly learns it, but so there is, yeah, it tried to learn it, but if was not so successful at a very early stage, but somehow it at one point learns about something and the loss dropped down fast, really fast. Okay, so now tries to learn a pattern, it's trying really hard, but so, yeah, it's, it's trying really hard, but seems it, it stopped here. So we can see that train loss here, it doesn't change because maybe there's, it has falls into what we call a local minima, where it's, uh, it's like a valley that it trapped you there. You see every, everywhere else around you are peaks and you don't see there should be another better point there because your vision is uh, limited into here. So what we, what we can do is we can try to add more hidden layers. 
we have more layer of nonlinearity. Yeah, I just uh, my primary setting is very arbitrary. I'm not sure how long it does, does it to take to learn because I hear my fans running really fast. Probably it's using my own computational power to 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 train a model. Um, yeah. So, and in the meanwhile, we can see that and from the input features, they're straight lines. They're pretty naive values. And in the first hidden layer, we see that they are trying to figure out some um, some error pattern. Oh, this one is struggling. Yeah. And then this layer, we, we can see that they are really fitting some nonlinear pattern because from the summary of this layer, probably they can find some more complicated combination of a pattern which we have just seen in the previous layer. And then we, they keep this process with a more complicated summary and then here, what we have here is, yeah, so it roughly, you can see that the yellow uh, points are classified to be yellow classes and blue points are classified to be blue points but maybe we're having a more too complicated model which well by this plot you may think that it's an overfitting or maybe we're having a more complicated uh, too, too complicated model to help us to, with the task yeah so this is the uh, part of the demo I'm not gonna spend too much time on it but this is just uh, offering you one insight on why we need Neural network and why we need activation and why we need multi layer, uh, multiple hidden layers. And you can play with it on, uh, yourself on your own, on, on your laptop or your server or whatever. And just remember it's going to burn your CPU because you can calculate on your own CPU. They don't offer a server to, uh, to calculate for you. Yep. Yeah, and uh, th th there are a lot of different things you can tune, like a learning rate in activation is value is more popular recently and regularization probably when we were if we add some regularization it's going to be smoother maybe the area that is classified uh, into yellow and blue and maybe we can have noises yeah yeah and that's the demo so today uh, there are a lot of different components that we have recently for deep learning, but today we're going to introduce several basic building blocks. The first is a fully connected layers. The second is convolutional. The third is pooling activation. Oh, I'll, I'll cover more about fully connected and activation first because we have already seen them here. So activation, as we have seen, is value, tangent, sigmoid, linear. Yeah, we can play a little bit with linear because with linear, you so have the linear relationship, you can't capture anything that uh, comes with a curve or even simply an XO, XOR relationship. So you can only cut one line there. So there's no multiple line or a curve to cut this data for you. Yeah. So fully connected, we've just seen a demo there. So in MSNet, how we define a fully connected layer is pretty straightforward. It's mx.symbol.fullyConnected. So symbol here is different from uh, what we have seen previously as ND for ND array. So symbol here is we use them as a building block or instructions for our backend to know that how we construct our graph. Then they have a knowledge to compile them on the backend and C++ side or compile them as CUDA code so that they have a very efficient um, piece of code. They compile the graph, entire, uh, the entire relationship into a graph and they can train and make prediction much faster. So we have MX symbol like as what we have demonstrated before. We don't only have fully connected, we also have a bunch of other operations. They are largely correlated or duplicated of the MXND operations. So say we have 
We also have MXND the fully connected here, which is another way that you can build your neural network, but they're not compiled, so they will be slower when you're doing the training and stuff. Yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll focus on the symbol interface here, MX.symbol, the fully connected. So this, this plot actually uh, contains two fully connected layers. The first is this half, the second is this half. Yep. The second is convolutional. So uh, it's not a so straightforward idea to understand. Maybe you know what convolution is in mathematically. But here is a two-dimensional convolution uh, operator. So the base green grid is the matrix or the input that we're going to perform the convolutional operator. And the yellow one is what we call a filter. If you, I'm afraid this is too small for you to look from the uh, projector, but if you uh, carefully look from your on screen, then you're gonna see some little one or zero, one or zero for each yellow grid on the lower left corner. That is the value of the filter. So the filter, what does the filter do? For every, uh, for every small part, this is a three times three square on a larger five times five uh, grid. So it just, we just slide it across every, every possible slot and we do a dot product here. Oh, no, no, it's not. Mm, yeah, we just do a element wise product here and we do a sum and we, it's kind of extracting the information uh, out of a larger matrix and shrink the information. Uh, yeah, and so to define a convolutional layer, you just mx.symbol.convolution. And next is pooling. So pooling is a very efficient way, to, another way to, do, to summarize the information from a picture or the input or matrix. So it's easier to understand. So we have, um, I, I, I remember this red block is a time, uh, it, th this large block is a 20 by 21. So the red one is 10 by 10. And it just look at one corner of the large matrix. I think this is, uh, we have to do one of op some operations. Sometimes we take the maximum value out of it or take the average value out of it. So these are two most common pooling operators we're gonna use. And then it just got a pulled feature. So it largely reduced the how many um, parameters that we're gonna use because it shrink the information and make a summary on it. Well, usually we don't do something that aggressive, like to shrink something from 20 to 20 to two, to two by two, which is just uh, gonna lose too many information. Yeah, and finally, activation. So this is a plot. Of, of the ReLU operator. So ReLU is, well, audit activation, the purpose are to introduce non-linearity -line uh, between the adjacency layers so that we can capture more curvy patterns or some high dimensional uh, interactions. So the ReLU here is X is the input and Y axis is the, the output. So if X, if the input is negative, it's zero. If it's positive, then it's just equals to its value, which is a very simple uh, activation function to learn and very simple to calculate its gradients and, and to implement. And also the sigmoid or the hypertangent functions, they are, all, they are all popular in some of the models. Okay, so that's the introduction of the, of the bottom blocks. And now we're gonna to play some training on MNIST dataset. So MNIST dataset is a dataset of handwritten digits. It was collected many years ago. It's like the hello world dataset for people who try to start to do some computation, uh, computer vision tasks. Because it's simple to understand, it's small to process, it's easy to train, to, vary, uh, to validate if your training pipeline is working good. So it's got 60,000 training samples and 10,000 uh, testing samples. 
it's in grayscale, and it's 28 by 28 of a relatively smaller size. So here is a sample of the numbers we're using. So actually, these numbers are not so easy to recognize. They're from various people. I remember they were high school students, I forgot. So they uh, take photos of their handwriting and make the, uh, build up the data set. So yeah, so now you can load in the data uh, under the, uh, the word directory with load data amnist. I felt, I felt really have it compressed here. So it's gonna load two objects into your environment. The first is train amnist, and the second is test amnist. So it's 785 columns because it, there's one column of label and 784 columns because it's 28 times 28. They just uh, pull it into one line and fit it into a matrix. Yeah, I've got a small helper function here to plot a number. Yeah, actually we can uh, plot more, to plot more value to make sure that our, that our code is uh, running smoothly. Yeah, just always double check your, oh, it's just so compressed. Yeah, it's six. And uh, we can also play with another, some other examples. Sometimes it's really hard to tell what a number is. Is it a seven? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so actually the data is not so straightforward and it's not gonna be tackled by some naive approach. Okay, some basic stuff that we wanna prepare our data. So we split the uh, input feature and the input label. The, these two objects, they always have the first column as a label and the rest of them are on uh, the feature. So for MXNet, it's convenient to define a input iterator, which is a interface for the MSNet to read the data because sometimes if we're training the data, we don't train with the entire data, entire 60,000 line, and to update our weight once. So we read them in small batches and so that we have moderate information, but we're still having uh, enough variance to, for our model to learn it. So with MX.io, IO means input output, array eater, because we have them as in RS array already, and MXNet treat our input as a column-based uh, column based setting. So the transpose of X is preferred. So it's a 784 times 60,000. One reason is because R naturally stores the value in column, if I recall correctly, so that it naturally in the memory, it just acts as the next, next value, next value as for that same data point. So it's easier, it's faster for you to access the value. Correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think I remember that's, one, uh, that's the most important reason. Okay, and for tests as well, so we have our input features as a first, and we have Y as a label, and we have batch size, you can set it to some, some number between like 32 or 1024, 2048. Why we set them as the power of two is because there are some settings in the GPU computation that um, they, they work with the power of two, uh, the batch with a power of two the best. They have some uh, memory mapping and stuff, so they prefer that you fill the, the, uh, the space of the GPU memory so that you give them full batch of this size and things like that, yeah. And for training, it's important that we shuffle it so every time you feed the data in a different order, so that we don't always, otherwise we'll look at a batch over and over again and every batch contains the same exact 128 images. This does not introduce any variance and this, uh, and shuffling the image could benefit our training. Okay, so now let's build our first um, multi-layer neural network first with only the fully connected and activation function uh, by the way, the first is we need, it's called mx.symbol.variable. 
it represents the input data, which is a special operator here. And we can assign a name here. Well, the name here is basically for when we're trying to uh, look into the model, we know where's the data. You can name it in whatever way you want. And then we define a hidden layer. So we call it fully connected one with MXNet symbol fully connected. So data here is the output we just have from our definition of a variable, which means its input is from this symbol. And then we set a value as number, hid number hidden means the uh, number of hidden values we have for this layer is 256. And we define a activation, so it's act. Or if you have multiple, you can try your best to name it act one or act two or whatever name you like. And it's activation, and it takes the input, it, it takes its input as the output from our first fully connected. So just notice the matching here. So we're having like a graph that we have one definition here, we have a point out to the next part, and the next part we remember to take where is the previous flow going on here. So if, imagine if we, if, if we replace the FC1 here with the data, then there's no one taking the output from FC1, and our data actually flows directly to these activation. So, which means we directly uh, take a hypertension uh, transformation on our input data and skip the first fully connected layer, which makes it uh, useless. That's not what we are trying to uh, we're trying to do. So, just uh, make sure that you have um, like a uh, from to from to. It's like that kind of, uh, relationship. And then we define our next fully connected. Now this time we have, uh, we use it as an output. So we have 10 hidden layer, uh, hidden node there, represent to the, the task we're going to perform with zero to nine digit classification. And finally, we have a soft max. This performs as our last function. So, Remember that previously when we're, uh, I was saying that the output node, they could have both very high uh, value as the output, but eventually we're gonna normalize them by the softmax uh, transformation so that we will have something that is the highest. So, and we will train our model based on the difference calculated from the softmax output and the actual label. Say, for example, we have input image is zero, and we have the first node, which corresponds to the zero, uh, with a very high probability, then we are having our model trained pretty well. If it's low, then we want to push back to say, to, to tell our training that you're not, you still need to train because you have a very, uh, very high loss value. So that's what softmax output many doing here. If you're use, if you're trying to do regression, then probably you want to use another head instead of this one. So what we have defined here is a 70, uh, 784 to 252 to 10 multi-layer neural network. So 784 comes from the input, which is 20A squared. So to 10 means that we have 10 classes. Just remember to uh, change it if you have another mission. Okay, so now we can, we get a net here. We use another new function. This is the main training function. Probably we may maybe wrap it into mx.train or something, making the name shorter. But it's, yeah, but basically it does, it trains the network. So we have multiple parameters to put into it. The first is the net we have just defined. And then we have the train mnist eater, which was defined previously as the, so that the eater and xnet can access the data in batches. We have context. We train it on CPU, as everyone else here today. And we have an evaluation metric. We use accuracy here for, that, for, for these 10, uh, 10 class classification. Uh, we have other options you can just check them with auto completion. And evaluate, evaluation data, we use a test data set here as evaluation. So during the training, we're gonna print out information. So learning rate is every time we wanna update our weight, we time a small, 
we, we hold it back as well. So we time our, our, great, our way to update, which is the gradient with the learning rate to a very small number so that we are pretty conservative in the process. And number of rounds. So one round is a full pass of the entire data. Remember that we are reading them in small batches. So probably say we have 60,000 batches over one, if a batch size is 100, then we're gonna do uh, look at small batches for 600 times. And that's a full, uh, so that's a full round or we call it epoch. So let's train this. Yeah. For model? For feed forward model of creation. Oh, you mean for this function, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So you just have this IO uh, iteration object. Yeah. Which defines the batch size. So what is the better way to do it, or do both work? Or um, yeah, I get your question. So you're, you're saying where should I set a parameters to, right? So these function, um, I think this function also take matrix input from R. So in that case, you want to set your batch size with the, in that function call. But in a more general way, because there are missions, for, for example, if no image net, it's over 100 gigabyte data set. You can't just load it into R. So usually we do that batch by batch and reading uh, from the disk. And we have another mx.io other iterator. So it's array eater. It's, well, it's less useful because people usually don't deal with data with deep learning that of such a small size that can fit into my max memory. Yeah, usually our task is very, with very large data, like 10 gigabytes or so, otherwise we don't have enough Im image, right? Yeah, so this is a demonstration that if you wanna use some other iterator for other type of input, yeah, you just replace it. But yeah, the pipeline here then doesn't change, just define a new iterator. Okay, yeah, so um, I'm gonna run here in the console to prepare the data, to prepare the iterator, and to define our net. Uh, okay, so now we have our net defined and we can start training I promise it's not gonna take you too long for every round, so you can also try that on your, on your own laptop with CPU. Yes, yeah, so you can see that it's printing out the information on the training data set and the validation data set. It's a little bit different than the previous session that in XGBoost we see that training accuracy is usually higher than the test accuracy. It's one reason is because that we have a shuffled input from the training data set, so stops it constantly to fit in on the same piece of data, because previously in XGBoost, always look at the entire data block at once, but here we have smaller batches, so introduce more variances. In other more mature, more developed pipeline, if you want to train your model on the on images, you might even need to do some data augmentation like to flip it around or to crop as some part of it, which makes it, makes the, mod, uh, makes the model even more difficult to overfit a training data set, which I think is a very good way and it's a very good approach. So if you have some images to fit. Yeah, so now it's finished. It just take maybe uh, a minute. Yeah, we are at around 95%. Yeah, so as, because this is a small data set, finally at a 10th epoch, the training accuracy overpassed the validation accuracy. Now if we keep training, I expect the training accuracy is gonna be higher because the information is just there, the variance is not, not enough. Okay, so uh, for simplicity, uh, if you want to train on a multi-layer, uh, you want to train on a multi-layer, 
your network, we offer a better interface for you to do that. So it offers some easy to tune parameters. So for these, for this function, what we have are, so first, the iterator. Then the hidden nodes, we can just set array at 256. We don't have to write mx.symbol that fully connected. And we have out node, which is the last, uh, which is the node of the last layer. And the context, of course, uh, we still keep ourselves on CPU side. And evaluation metric and evaluation data, th these, these are the same anyway. So we offer several things to control the build of our network, which makes it easier to, to train. So it's, it's just the same thing, pretty much the same thing. Yeah, it's mx.mlp. Actually, the MLP is short for multi-layer perceptron. Perceptron is some kind of fully connected layers uh, it's a very early stage neural network idea. But it's so useful for a lot of data. Okay, yeah, so with this interface, we can easily expand here. What we have changed is just hit the number of hidden nodes here. But we might want to add, make, make the model deeper. So from 784 to 256 and to 10, uh, 200 to 50 and then to 10. Let's see how it goes. I, uh, I just set up this network arbitrarily. arbitrarily. Let's hope it goes past in 95.8 percent. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's, uh, it's, it's been trained. We can yeah. So we can see that this model is not acting like the previous one. So what we have here for first epic or first round here, we already hit 88 and 92 on uh, training and validation respectively. But here, it's having a really hard time to capture what is in the data at the beginning because we have a much deeper neural, neural network structure and has much more parameters optimized. So it's, it's further, like, it needs more effort to really to understand the data to across all its layers. Yeah, so like, it's catching up at the eighth or ninth. So with more complicated structure, probably we need more time to train because it needs more time to polish its value of its weight and to really capture the underlying pattern of the data. Yeah, maybe we need to let it run for 50 rounds or something, but I'm not going to do that for now. Yeah, so um, with this interface, we can construct a neural network with uh, fully connected layers and activation. Also, we have dropout and other, we have control of activations. You can see the help documentation for more information. Yeah, I think I'll leave the practice uh, maybe as, a, yeah, as your homework. Okay. And then we play with another similar data set, but much more difficult to learn because previously we are using a very simple uh, neural network and we got 95. Actually, we can get 98, 99, somewhere like that, which is pretty simple to fit amnist, which also makes it the hello world example. Okay, so this is fashion amnist. It is trying to mimic the amnist in terms of the format, but the content is, I feel it's more interesting. Like, it's called fashion amnist. It got 10 classes of the wearings like t-shirts or high heel shoes, not just shoes, or shirts, or bags, or boots, and jeans, something like that. Also 10 classes, also 28 times 28 in grade school, also 60,000 for training and 10,000 for testing. So they're pretty much in the same format. But this one, because we can see that it's, some, it's more difficult to tell a, a to, to separate t-shirt from shirt based on a small image then separate zero to from eight, right? So I feel, I feel like it's more interesting and it's more um, suitable for me to introduce a convolutional layer. Okay, so you just know, uh, you just load the data with low data, it's called F amnist, which is uh, short for fashion amnist. I'll do that the same time. Yeah, so we just check the dimension. They are of the same, uh, they are the same format. Yeah, we used the previous plotting function. We just plot it. It's a shirt. Yeah. 
maybe. Yeah, which makes it approve that it's pretty difficult. Like, uh, yeah, and you can play some more if you want. So we define it pretty much the same. We just add an F before the MNIST because they're just so identical, which saves some of, of our effort. And we also define the array eater here. Okay, so we start training with our previously defined smaller neural network. It's a 784 neural network, and then to 256 and to 10. Yeah, we can see here now the accuracy is pretty low. Comparing to a previous one, it hits 90%, like a piece of cake, but here it struggled around 74. Yeah, we're let around for a few more seconds. Okay, so one issue is that we have a lot of parameters, but with an image, we have some uh, we have some local correlations on the image. Like if we only look at a small part of the image, they're still correlated. For example, a T-shirt, you got this is um, this my sleeves. If you just crop it, you can't just crop one part and the other part without the in internal connection. So a fully connected layer is not the most efficient way to learn about the, uh, the relationships on an image from an image input. Yeah, so now we start around 80, 82%. Okay, let's see, can we do better? So we try a neural network called Lynette, which is uh, the earliest well-known convolutional neural network. I'm not going to say it's the first neural net, uh, convolutional neural network, but it's the first well-known convolutional neural network. It was used in digit, handwritten digit recognition for banks, like for checks and stuff, uh, like almost 20 years ago. Yeah. So this is the structure of the neural, neural network. So you can take a closer look at it. Okay. So here's the input. So they're using a, a 32 times 32, but we're using 28 times 28, which doesn't change much. It's just a matter of the input format. Okay, so a convolution, just uh, think back when we were doing a demonstration, we have a very large matrix, and we have a smaller, we call it filter, to look, slide across every row, every column of, the, of a large matrix, and we take an elemental dot on it. And the filters, they have their value so that they somehow extract the pattern out of the input image. So we call them, so we have a, we call them a feature map here. So we actually extracting features from the image and we, uh, that's a map of a feature. So here the six means we have six kind of, six filters, different filters to apply on that image. We don't necessarily have to only use one. We can use multiple, we can use 600 which makes our model larger, but also maybe more powerful. Yes, it's one parameter that uh, to, to we use to construct our neural network. And because we are having a uh, convolution, so our output here is gonna be shrinked by a bit. So if you check back with, yeah, with this, this example, the output has a smaller size comparing to the previous one. Yeah, so that is why here it was three, 32 times 32, then it shrank to 28 times 28 because our filter has size. Well, some, uh, there's tricks that you can pad uh, the original image with a bunch of zeros around the original image. Makes, makes it like to 40 to 40, then you, up, then you slide your filter on the padded larger input image so that you have the output in the exact same shape. Yeah, but we're not gonna uh, cover that, but just uh, let you know that it's possible to do that. And then we do another, um, so the subsampling here is called polling, which means we sample information from the area, maybe by the average or by, uh, to calculate the maximum value in it, yeah. And then we do another convolution, and then we do another sampling, and we have to fully connect it. And the Gaussian connection here, I believe it is the, um, it is softmax. Yeah, 
So based on this plot, we're going to implement this network structure. It's actually a relatively simple one. Uh, well, but it's pretty difficult comparing to the previous MLP. Yeah, I'll get you through that how we can have it implemented at MaxNet. So this is a bit long. Um, yeah, I'll take it line by line. So first of all, we still have the data. Otherwise, the model takes no input. The second, we take these three together. We have a convolution layer. We have an activation. We have a polling with max. Okay, what do they mean? So we compare with this plot. So first, it, the, the input size shrink from 32 to 28, which means the filter is five times five uh, because it has four less, four grid less if we uh, slide it around in the entire row. So it's a five times five size filter, has six filters. So what we have is kernel is C55, which means the size of a filter and the number of filter. And this is the input we're from the data input layer. And then we have the value, which is a popular activation here for its simplicity to calculate because it's computationally advantage than the uh, sigmoid or tangent. And then we have a subsampling here, but it doesn't mention, but uh, from a paper, it's a max polling. And it's a, we use a kernel to, to, to so that it looks at a two times two area and takes a max value out of it. So that we, it shrinks from 28 times 28 to 14 times 14. And on every, every filter, we have a 28 times 28 output. And then for every filter, we have a 14 times 14 output after we've got a pulling. Is that clear? Okay, and then we perform something similar. We also shrink it to 10 by 10, and then we somehow, uh, we define it as, okay, like here. Wait. Okay, now just notice uh, we, the second com, we, I name it as com2, that its input is pole one which corresponds to the previous polling layer. Wait. And so here we have 16 filters. So now it's 16 here. We also, we have activation as value and polling as with max polling. Okay. Okay, after the two, Convolution, activation, polling, definitions, we now are going to use a fully connected. So that we use a flatten here because our input at that time, it was a 28 times 28 array. It's not a uh, pulled one dimensional data. So we flat it from a 28 times 28 array into a 784 one dimensional vector. And then we define our fully connected layer activation, we also use value here. So fully connect here, we use 120, which is, yeah, which is here, 120. And then it becomes what we have done so far. We define two more layers with 84 and 10, and 10 number of hidden layer, uh, hidden nodes respectively. And finally, we have a softmax output here. 120, 84, and 10. Now we have our Lynette defined. So any questions so far? Okay, cool. Yeah, so to train with a convolutional neural network, we need to manipulate a bit over our data. So remember that our data was a matrix as the input here that we can just uh, call them and to you know. So, oops, yeah. Yeah, so it's a matrix here. So what we're, going, what we're gonna do is we first take a transpose of it because uh, I'm actually prefer the, uh, 
a column-based uh, training so that it's a 784 times 60,000. And we divide it by 255. I, th I think this is not necessary. It really depends on the network you're using. Uh, you don't have to shrink it to uh, between zero and one. So the difference here is how the scale of the numeric value of your weight. Because if your weight, uh, because if your input is large, then if your weight want to take it down, your weight's gonna be like a little bit smaller. So like 200 times 0 0.1 equals to one. So uh, yeah, that might be different. And, but I think with or without it, you can train a pretty good neural network. Um, yeah, and then we have the X in a shape of 784 times 60,000. And then to let the, our convolutional op operator run smoothly, we reshape the 784 into 28 times 28. And we notice that we have a, a, an additional one here. So what's it for is it's for the color channel because when we are training with RGB image, then it has three channels. And we are training with grayscale, so we put in one here. So probably if you have a color fashion amnest, probably you're gonna try to transpose it into 28283 and the number of samples. And we didn't do anything to the, uh, to the label. Yeah, so we perform the same to the test and we redefine our input iterator. Okay. Okay, so here comes the important part where GPU is so powerful. Uh, I'm gonna train just one round with CPU. It's gonna be pretty slow. If I remember correctly, it's gonna take around a minute or around 30 minutes, oh, no, sorry, or 30 seconds to train just for one round. Uh, one reason is that comparing to our previous MLP models, it's more complicated. And another reason is that uh, CPU is not so fast in this convolution and the flow point calculation. Because when we're doing com a convolution, we have a folder uh, frequently uh, slide and take an element-wise dot. Uh, against the large matrix and do a sum. These are num enormous calculation uh, yeah, power attempts. And here, yeah, so although we only have one round, we compare with our previous result with our MLP. We can see that we trained for 10 rounds and MLP hardly hit 82%. But now we just one round, one pass over the train data. We're already at 81.6%. So to demonstrate the power, my server's got a GPU, so if anyone got their GPU configured and uh, they're comfortable that, they're confident that they can run on GPU, you can also train that. Uh, train that we have num round to 10. Let's see. Yeah, the GPU is gonna be so fast that you can just uh, hear and seeing that a number got uh, going up rapidly. So here we learn two things. The first is GPU really benefits your training if you're using something like a convolution neural network or any other things so as low point calculation expensive. Like previously, we've already demonstrated the matrix modification. And yeah, it's like uh, it's 90 somewhere. And second is convolutional neural network captures the information and use them in a more efficient way than the MLP. MLP just got too many redundant uh, connections. That's my point of view. So that it's re actually really hard to let it to capture the local correlation from the input. Okay, and on the other hand, it is pretty sensitive to the parameters that we're using. So I'm training it with only turning learning rate down by a factor of 10. And then we can see how it learns. I remember it learns a little bit differently because here, 74, 
because previously we start with, uh, with somewhere at 80. And it's hard to, yeah, because learning rate and, well, it's be, one, one, one reason is because the learning rate, we hold it back, so it learns slower. And sometimes there are some uh, initializers. So here, notice, I didn't mention it. I initialize the network by a method called Shavir. It's a specific way to initialize the layers in your network. There are various ways to do initialization. Some are good, some are not good. Some type of layers prefer this way. Some type of layers prefer that way. Uh, you can get more information from your um, practical experience or from the papers that how people have success in these settings and how people are having different results with various experiments across different data sets. Yeah, so if we remove it, I remember they're initialized as a constant, I forgot. So in my own experiment, yeah, and this one, it hardly learned anything. So it's crucial to initialize the neural network in a correct way. Yeah, so it's, it's just don't learn. You can see a validation accuracy states that the random guess is 10% correct for a 10 class classification. All right. Okay, so here's a very fast demonstration on, so why do we say MNIST is too simple to learn? So we're just loading back the MNIST data set and we're, we're going to train it with the LNET neural network. Also with 10 around, oh, it's already 97 at the first, first epic. Yeah, because the pattern is so obvious, it's so easy to capture. And that is what Lynette was proposed for 20 years ago. It was proposed to uh, identify the handwritten digit. So yeah, so what we have seen here, during its stage of design, it must have been changed and tuned by a lot so this network is super suitable for handwritten digit recognition. But also, the data set itself is pretty easy. Like 10 epics, we're almost 99% accurate. And there are people tuning, uh, tuning it to be 99.7, 99.9, somewhere there, it's almost perfect. But with Fashion MNIST, it's really hard to do that. The best, Fashion MNIST, they have their own GitHub page and I looked into it, it seems the best is around 95 or 96%, which is, yeah, which is so a way, uh, bit way to go uh, from perfect, being perfect. Yeah, so what we have learned here is GPU is helpful and convolution for image input is really helpful and parameter tuning is crucial. Uh, I shouldn't say it's helpful here because usually it makes you in a, uh, in a really bad position. So you, you need to really be careful and know what you're doing or have learned that other people are doing it and they have success in a way, especially for uh, like Lynette or even deeper neural networks. So they're even more sensitive to your parameter tuning. Okay, do so we have some, uh, we've still, still got 10 minutes. So any questions at this point? Okay, then I'll go over the next section uh, pretty fast. So sometimes we don't train our model or maybe we are limited by our computational resources. Say, I'm only having a laptop. How do I recognize objects from some images I took yesterday? But from MNIST, no, it doesn't tell you how to, how to recognize different objects or neither from fashion MNIST. But there are some large data set, like for example, ImageNet, it has uh, the full set of ImageNet has 21,000 classes over, I forget how many millions of data. And the standard data set is uh, 1,000 classes over 100, no, no, 1.2 million images. So that occupies you over 130 gigabyte on your disk. So usually people don't train them at home. But how do, but how to benefit from it? So uh, we offer some pre-trained models, as most of the frameworks also do that. So we train our model with some uh, various neural networks, and you can just load it and make your own application, or to train on top of it, or to just to have fun. 
So here's a link. Uh, it's also in progress that we're going to have an easy to use API, just a direct call that is going to download it directly. So we have our models hosted here. So click ImageNet, or it's trained on a larger set, ImageNet 11K, which means it has uh, 11K classes. We have different uh, ResNet, ResNext. I'm not sure if you know about that, but today we're going to use a ResNet here, a smallest 18 layer, yeah, 18 layers. ResNet is the smallest already. So comparing to our Linnet, which was uh, six, seven layers like that. So yeah, with a, such a large training data, you really need a powerful model to handle all the information and extract useful features in it. So uh, we can load in. Uh, we can download the, uh, the models and the model definition and the model parameters. And also here, the synset text is a 1,000 line text file to let you know what classes you're actually predicting. So the class names, basically. So to load it, it's pretty easy. So note that we have um, in the model directory with ResNet-18- uh, quadruple zeros. It's it's from our uh, during our training we can set called checkpoints. So every epic you can save your model. So we load model rest uh, dash eighteen. So it automatically matches dash eighteen symbol, which is the definition of the of a neural network, or and the parameters, the values of the weights in it. So we only need the prefix, and you just need to uh, specify which. A checkpoint of the parameter you want to use. Sometimes it's not training longer, the better. Sometimes it's in between, so you might want to load it. So we're having a zero, so we use zero here. Oh, well, it's loaded. Okay, so we need to preprocess the image before we really fit into the model. So uh, this is a demonstration of the center crop. So first, model only takes a square as the as the input. So if you have a image of a panorama one for four probably you, you want to cut them into uh, different pieces and just don't compress them into one versus one without respect to the aspect ratio Although, because that's gonna disturb the original ra shape of the objects in the original image you're gonna maybe you're gonna get some pretty bad prediction because like a ball is gonna be sharp all right it's not gonna classify it's not recognize it yeah, so center crop, probably we just crop it, the center square out of it, and we normalize the data. So center crop, I've got a helper function. So basically, we calculate, uh, we, we use the help of an imager. Is it an image R? Yeah, I should read it that way, image R. So it's a convenient library uh, doing image operations. So we just calculate where we want to crop, and we call it a crop borders. And then we, okay, and other, other ways, we resize the image to the size that when they are training the image. So the usual way, the, usually people train ResNet with 224 times 224, or sometimes it's 299 times 299. The larger the image, the better quality you have, usually the better precision you get. But, um, but uh, usually people saw that as a benchmark, so, so to evaluate the performance of different models. So we don't uh, discuss about that much, but here we resize. Remember that we might want to resize it into a certain size. Here we're going to use 224. So yeah, so we calculate the region and we crop it and we resize it into a specific shape. Okay, and next is normalize the image. Yeah, so for neural network, um, especially when you're using a pre-trained model, you really need to normalize the image as when people are training the image. So what do they normalize? So it's, of course, reshape them into in a square. And then they are going to minus the average value across the entire image net data set on the RGB channel respectively. So that's it. Uh, and they are in 0 to 200, uh, 255 scale. So here we're reading the image. And note that the image R package loading your image and automatically 
compress the value between 0 and 1, we need to rescale it up back because our model takes images a larger numerical scale. And then for every channel, we minus the mean vector. These are parameters you can find online because you, if you're using a image not trained model, you really want to know that how the model is being trained. Otherwise, there's no way you can confidently use it for your later tasks. Okay, so this is one sample image. Oh, it's just too small. Help us. Yeah, so it's a photo of mountain. Yeah, it's somewhere 1,400 and 3,000. Yeah, and we just load image here and resize the image to, with a center crop. So compare this one and this one, we're really cropping the center part of it. And then we normalize the image. So these are the three numbers uh, corresponding to the RGB channels, the, the, the mean value across RGB channels on the ImageNet data. Uh, I think these numbers you can find them in anywhere and it's pretty standard. So if you want to use a pre-trained model for a test, just remember that you need to do normalization. Otherwise, the model is going to be confused. Okay, then we, we have loaded, loaded in the model already. We just make predict. So it, out, the output is a 1,000 against one probability vector because we have in total 1,000 probability, uh, 1,000 classes. So we take the top five classes IDs, but we still don't know what they're talking about. We just read in that uh, name of classes. Read in is model inside text, and we print them. So the top five classes we have is volcano, Alf, mountain, tent, valley, vale, lakeside, lakeshore. I would say they are pretty good guesses, especially the first one. It's, is it volcano? I believe the mountain it is, or Alps is pretty close. Yeah, and so this is one way that you can make use of pre-trained model. Say, for example, you want to build an application and tell, uh, speak out loud where the camera is pointing to. So maybe uh, you can use the pre-trained model and every, every second you just take a screenshot and you fit it to the model and to match it, make a prediction, match it to the class names and just uh, read it out and something like that or make it even funnier. I'm not, I don't have a funny idea here right now. Yeah, but. Or sometimes you can say, for example, you have another task. For example, I know there are people, say, from um, online retailers they have their own pictures of the, their goods, and they want to uh, make prediction on the photo, what they are, or sometimes if they're like uh, selling clothes, they want to know that uh, what kind of clothes is it? Is it a t-shirt, some, some, something like a fashion amnesty is doing? A t-shirt or a shirt or skirt or something like that? Uh, so, but maybe they only have like 10,000 images, that's not enough for a model to learn from scratch. So now you can learn from a preaching model with a starting point where it has already got knowledge of over a thousand classes. And starting from that, which means like we use the same network structure and we initialize a network, not by some random numbers, but from a pretty successful, already well-trained model. And from there, we start to train the model again, which is actually a very effective way to start your own model training on your own customized data set. Sometimes we call it fine tune or transfer learning or some other terms, but that's the basic idea. So in this case, it's really useful. Um, yeah, um, because we're right at 12.30 right now, so there are several practices. You can try to see how image is going to be, uh, how the results going to be if you are fitting in non-standard preprocessed pre image. Or you can take a photo and try it with your own image because I may be cheating because I pick the best performed prediction out of my 100 gallery. And uh, try another model because I offer you the smallest one. So a larger model may have better performance, but it's also going to be larger. So for a large model on CPU, you might even expect the prediction is not so smooth because it might take like 0.5 seconds to make prediction or something like that. With CPU, yeah. So these are several things you can try. 
Uh, what else? Uh, with deep learning, there are just so many things uh, that you can do. Just uh, well, people usually only focus on one specific field and to dig deeper because in every field there are so many things to push, push them to the the best. There are so some potential uh, in every domain they're using the deep learning. I think. Yeah, and about we've got a bunch of examples in our GitHub. So uh, just. We've ha uh, this is a GitHub page of MSNet, the projects and the pub project. And we have a uh, folder called example. So there are several examples in it. Also, you can also train ImageNet if you, you really like. We offer training script uh, to help you to set up your training on ImageNet. And also, we have a forum. So remember that previously for ActuBoost, we have discuss.actuBoost.ai. Now, this is discuss.msnet.io. So they're a little bit different, but with my slides downloaded, I believe you can find them easily. Yeah, and these are casual forums that you can post any question you have and hope the community is gonna help you. Okay, and that's it, thanks. <laughs> so um, any questions? Or maybe if don't have right now, we can discuss them offline. Yep, thanks, just enjoy your din uh, lunch. Oh, okay. um, loading the pre-trained model in my RPG crash, is there, is there a way to do that? So what's the crash? I, I can debug with you. So uh, I need you to check what the crash information is. All right? Wait, where is it? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I can download them. Yeah. When I load it, you said RPG Oh, really? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll help you out with that. Anyone else has the same error, like the crashed? Can't find in the array what? Well. Hmm, that's where. Yeah, I'll, I'll also help you with that. Okay. Yeah, or if you have further questions, just come to me, and we can discuss that offline. Thanks.